Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. It's a rare and happy privilege for me today. No? Was that better? Yeah. Yeah, it is a rare and happy privilege for me today to be able to introduce a loved and honored friend of nearly 30 years and one who was very important to me in my early days of sobriety. Right after World War II, a young and bouncy Nell Wing popped out of the U.S. Coast Guard Service after trying a few other things, landed on the doorstep of what is now uh, the General Service Office of Alcoholics Anonymous in New York City. For a number of years, she was the only non-alcoholic on the staff there. For 20 years, she was secretary to Bill W., co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous and chief architect of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, Along the way, she acquired some other duties, like being executive secretary of the General Service Board of AA, uh, publications editor, and if you see all the pamphlets and the books and stuff out there, you can see what the task that might have been. I'm sad, man. <laughs> and, while, and all the time collecting and uh, filing data, which became in time the foundation for the archives of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when uh, for the 10 years prior to Nell's retirement in 1982, she was the archivist of AA. If that weren't enough, on alternate weekends, she was going up to Steffi Stones, which was the home of Bill Lois and Bill W. in Bedford Hills, New York, and taking care of Lois's correspondence, which must have gotten voluminous because... Uh, Nell was the founder of Alana, or excuse me, Lois was the founder of Alana. In 1965. <laughs> 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 In 1965, I'd been dry and somewhat sober for a little over a year, and by a chain of fortuitous circumstances uh, connected with uh, uh, the Catch-22 situation I was in in relation to my job with an airline, I landed in the (coughs) hands of Bill W. And uh, since we couldn't make contact, uh, to meet at his one day that he spent in the office in New York. He invited me <laughs> to come up and spend a weekend with he and Lois and now uh, in uh, Stepping Stones. And um, the Bill knew that my two previous sponsors have gone out and done some more research for us. And one day, uh, Nell informed me that Bill considered himself my sponsor. But that's another story for another time. Uh, I spent many happy weekends in uh, Stepping Stones with these three wonderful people. Those of you who were at the uh, AA convention in Seattle in 1990 uh, had the opportunity to witness Nell being honored and being given, uh, presented the one millionth copy of the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Last year in 1992, uh, <laughs> it's more fun being a straight man than a speaker. (laughs) 
1982, uh, Nell was asked, urged, pleaded with, cajoled, and finally agreed to write her memoirs. Uh, <coughs> she called it, Grateful to Have Been There. The subtitle, My 42 Years with Bill and Lois and the Evolution of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can't improve on the words in the preface to this great little book. And it reads in part. (laughs) (laughs) I'll read something else here. It reads in parts. No other living person knows more about how Alcoholics Anonymous developed and how it grew. No other living person has been as close and perceptive of an observer of the excitement, the turbulence, and the spiritual underpinnings of what may be the most important social movement of the 20th century. With a full heart, I invite you to help me <coughs> to welcome to our first ever Monterey Bay Area Roundup, Miss Snell Wing. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. That was very good. <laughs> Hi. Just one uh, more little correction. Um, I wasn't a staff member um, in many ways. I had <laughs> some of the staff responsibilities in the very beginning when I came there in 1947. Um, I was a uh, receptionist. Well, I'll go, let me just have an opening and give my very, very sincere and beloved thanks to all of you, to Jerry and the committee, to Tom, uh, to, to uh, um, uh, Todd um, Smith, who I had a little eye opener because Todd Smith is also the name of Bob Smith, uh, Dr. Bob's son, um, Bob's son, Bob Jr.'s son. So I thought, how did Todd, uh, 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 um, Todd Smith get here? And uh, so <laughs> it was a different Todd Smith and a very nice one, too. In there. <laughs> uh, also, of course, I'm very grateful to Chuck for being here, and uh, we've had a long, long friendship, as he said. So I can uh, play little tricks and do things like that, and he 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 won't care. <laughs> and I hope uh, at the beginning that you will excuse the note. I really, I'm now uh, 76. My memory is going down through the slats of the floor. And uh, what? Not so much for a lot of uh, recollections and the memories, memoirs, but all, but for about uh, ten seconds past, can't remember what happened. Uh, <laughs> it's very scary. Uh, my nephew wanted me to come over, and I did go over to his group in New Jersey, and um, I, I did it all offhand as I usually do. And um, uh, before I knew it. Um, I was saying, oh gosh, where did, why did I say that? Because one anecdote would lead to another, and I would forget what originally I had started out to say. And uh, one guy, right, sitting in the uh, front seat, uh, I yelled out what, where, where I had, what I meant, where I was. And uh, I made about ten different um, uh, um, faults like that. And everybody was sitting on the edge of the seat waiting for me to do it so they could yell out where I was. <laughs> I hope I don't do that too often. <laughs> uh, anyway, please excuse the notes. I hope you won't mind. You know, it's, it's, I, I wish I had a story to tell, but if I had, if I told my drinking story, you'd be long gone. Uh, I'd be here, but you wouldn't. <laughs> so we won't get into that at all. <laughs> During the 40s, that time when we ladies were traveling all over doing our own thing. Oh, it's a great time. Um, I said for Paradis. I was in the Coast Guard. <laughs> she knows that. Um, anyway, what I wanted to say was that um, I am apt to, without notes, also overspeak. Uh, I go on and on and on and on. Everybody knows that. In fact, one time I thought maybe I might uh, uh, 
form a new um, group called Over Speakers Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> I still think, don't think that would be a bad idea. <laughs> Get a little system into the whole thing. <laughs> also, my favorite, one of my favorite stories that I heard a long, oh, years ago, I think it was at the New York banquet, the uh, 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 speaker from Australia was said this little story. He said there were two uh, friends who came into a meeting uh, one night, and uh, they were sitting there in the, with the group in the audience, and they were waiting and uh, for the uh, uh, talk to proceed and get going, and which it did. Went for a half hour, then an hour, an hour and a half. And finally, one of the friends was getting very fidgety, and he was looking all around the walls and whatnot, and his friend said to him, hey, what are you looking for? And a clock? And the friend said, no, I'm looking for a calendar. And so <laughs> that, that is often one of the things when I said, I was telling Midge, uh, uh, one of our staff members, that um, um, how difficult it was to tell in a prescribed length of time what I wanted to say about history. I'm an old history teacher, by the way, so listen up. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and describe the people, the events, the places, what happened. It is very necessary, and I won't go into that right now, but um, I was telling Midge about this, and I said, gee, I don't, it's awfully hard to know what, to, uh, uh, what stories to tell, uh, what is most important, et cetera. She said, look now, she said, you don't have to tell everything you know. And I said, well, okay, that's, um, that, I, never, I really truly never thought of that. Um, it was like kind of like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, it's a long time since I read the story, but Alice uh, wanted to tell, I can't remember what it was, a story, uh, her story, or get some idea of what um, she was going through and for what reason, et cetera, et cetera. So she asked the good queen uh, where to uh, begin. The good queen draws herself up to her height and looks down at Alice and, uh, Alice and says, why, of course, begin at the beginning. That's where you begin. And I thought, oh, that's good. That's a very, very smart thing to say. That's where it should be anyway. And so, okay, so that will do it for me. And uh, we'll go back briefly, I hope. I'll try 54 years when I first heard about AA. <laughs> I was a uh, junior in college in 1939 at um, a co in college upstate New York. And uh, I heard uh, about this Liberty magazine. Of course, we were reading Liberty magazines because everybody, uh, it was kind of a, it wasn't, it wasn't staid and uh, um, not very interesting like Saturday Post or Reader's Digest or things like that. It was kind of full of good stuff. And um, so we all uh, enjoyed Liberty magazine. And inside that uh, was one very good article called Alcoholics and God by Morris Markey. And um, I read that, and immediately I was so taken, and I have no idea why, except I do in a way. My dad was a, a, profe a, te a teacher, a professor, and a uh, justice of the peace in our little small town. We were used to um, our family about 3 o'clock every, uh, not every, maybe once a week at least, maybe twice a week, with the state police coming in, dragging a drunk in to my dad's uh, for uh, uh, DWI or whatever it might be. Now, half of these people were my father's good friends, and uh, they were professional people in the small town. One could be a mayor, one could be whatever. And this went on and on, and I learned very quickly, very early on, that an alcoholic, is not necessarily a Bowery bum. And this was what one of the, the good outcomes, the, the good message of the, a good movie called Lost Weekend in the middle 40s met, because here was a good businessman and had started to drink and was drinking what, and went down to the level of a Bowery bum. And uh, I learned that very early. And so, uh, anyway, I graduated from school. I went down to, I went teaching down in Mexico, and in, 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 I was headed for, wanted to be headed for Mexico, but I was in San Antonio, my mother's hometown. I uh, taught for a while in a Mexican school there. Came back, became, had secretarial experience and became a secretary. Uh, the, a couple friends at the office where I was working wanted to go into the uh, spars and uh, wanted to know if I wanted to come along and Joyce said, no, not really, I'm not that interested. Finally, they persuaded me and I did go. 
I took the test and they persuaded me to do that and the oral exams and uh, uh, physicals. I passed everything. They didn't. So I found myself a week later raising my right hand hoping to, and hoping to die to, to protect my country. And uh, so I did that for two years out in Seattle. And uh, that was, that was it's often, all, always good to get back there because I have so many memories of that state and that city. Um, so what I did then uh, was come back after uh, Spires and decided now I really no serious relationship in mind. So I decided I'd go down to Mexico and sculpture, which is what I really like. Um, I went um, down to New York City to get a um, job because I needed a little more money than my mustering out pay. It wasn't very big. And uh, so I went to an uh, employment agency, and the ga- lady uh, took my resume, read it, and came back, sat across me from the table, and she said, how would you like to work at Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, oh, I'd love it. I, I spoke, I just yelled it out and just blew it right off her chair. And um, a- anyway, I decided, you know, what better of a little temporary job? It's a super. And so um, <laughs> on Monday morning, I went to the um, office and Marion, there just had been a little turnaround at that point of some effort to make, bring order out of chaos. And I, I could tell you, I can't go into all the stories. There's too many. And uh, so Marion interviewed me, and finally we, she was just out of the waves, and I was out of the spars, and so we um, talked about that. Finally, I thought, gee, i got to get around to seeing what, what I'm going to get for the money, salary. So um, I asked her, and she said, now, no. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we are a spiritual program, <laughs> and uh, we do spiritual good for people. I said, okay, I, I know, I got the message. I know what, what it is. So instead of temporary job, I was there for 36 years. <laughs> and uh, just then to hurry it up a little bit, um, I was a receptionist for the first seven years and started in 50. To, uh, this was in, in, in uh, March 3rd. I'm talking about 47 when I came to the office. And it did Bill's job, uh, Bill's work, uh, helped with him with his work, uh, 1950 until he died in 71, very January. That's 20 years. And uh, then, of course, in the next 17 years, I was, I was also a very good companion, very close to Lois. And it was a, a disaster when she died and passed away, except we knew it was going to happen. It's um, uh, hard to take uh, in your family, which Bill and Lois were to me, um, possibilities of passing into another uh, life existence and whatnot. Anyway, um, that is uh, what um, roughly what uh, then I ended up after uh, Bill died and, and, and started uh, uh, doing some other jobs. And then in the 50, 80s, I started doing the archives, uh, or I started doing the archives in 71 after he died until I retired, so-called retired, <laughs> until um, 1982. And it's been a joy to remain around ever since and all of that. Um, it's been so wonderful to be invited out, and that has been the, the real mainstream of my growth. It has been ever since I came to the fellowship. Uh, I won't go into what I learned because you know what I learned. It's, it's um, how to love people, how to uh, give of yourself, how to be a spirit, hopefully kind of a spiritual person. It has kept on going and all that and all that time. Also, one of the joys of all that time that I spent was meeting so many people, not only wonderful AA friends, but professional people. I knew so many and know so many. So many have left us in the last couple of years. It's very, very sad. One of the ones that um, I uh, uh, um, enjoyed so much was um, Irving Harris. Irving uh, was a great friend of Sam Shoemaker and uh, helped him in the latter days after uh, Sam had gone through that decision of 41, called out to uh, 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 the Oxford group out there in British Columbia to respond to what was going on and his, his attitude towards the Oxford groups and all that. Anyway, the decision of that, what that came, they came to, it's called the decision of 41. And after that time, that event, uh, Sam became closer even to uh, Irving Harris, who helped him with a newsletter called Faith at Work, and possibly a lot of you know uh, this, this story. Um, 
he, um, <coughs> pardon me, uh, Sam and Irving often use the words, it works. It works. Sam said, like Christianity, Christianity, it works. And I have, a, that was really, I think, uh, the, the uh, uh, place where it came to AA, work publishing. And I know that Ann Smith also used faith at work. And what, but I still think it was more Sam's influence on that whatnot. Anyway, uh, Irving uh, wrote a book called Breeze of the Spirit, and it is a wonderful, wonderful story. This is before he died. It's a wonderful story of uh, what the Oxford Group was all about, what Sam Schumacher was all about. He talks about Bill. He gives a marvelous background. Lois and I went over to um, Bermuda, where uh, Julie and uh, Irv spent their winters, and I wanted to get him on tape. This was uh, for the archive. And um, anyway, so we went over there, and I did interview him, had a good interview with him, and, and we were good we were good friends. And um, one time, um, he, or was it, was it, or, no, I don't think it, Yes, yes, it was Irving, uh, still, still around at that time, when the group, called the Oscar groups called the Willow Bank community in Bermuda met and uh, Lois and I neither Lois and I were too aware of uh, their still association and they're still going on at that time anyway we had our uh, hotel so to speak over in that area we were out one day walking around and sightseeing and uh, came back to the uh, Willow Bank and uh, in the big living room uh, here was a lot of people gathered and um, uh, we said, oh, fine. Lois and I looked at our watches, and it was tea time, 4 o'clock. We said, okay, we'll go and have a cup of tea, which we did, and found out that we were in the middle of an Oxford group meeting. And um, that was so exciting. And so if anybody asked me, do I know anything about Oxford group meetings, have I ever been to one? I have, indeed. It's very exciting. Uh, this, this book is published by, it's called A Crosswords Book by Seabury Press in New York. But I would suggest if you ever find it and in the, in the, in the want to send, try to investigate further about it or see it in the bookstores, please do, because it's full of history. It's full of information about those very, very early days. Believe me. Okay, now what I want to do is, here we're talking about uh, um, old timers, and um, I guess, you know, there is such a, you know, how do you describe an old timer? I guess any of us could be called an old timer in any, in any type of work we were in or anything we contributed or in terms of what we remember in any given time frame. So what I'll do is say you're an old timer if. You're an old timer if you remember nickel therapy. Do you know, remember nickel therapy? Anybody? Well, in the old days, <laughs> uh, when you wanted to call your sponsor on a phone, on the phone, outside or whatever, um, you um, put in a nickel because that's what it took at those days, in those early days. And it got to be called nickel therapy. And I suppose now it would be called 25 cent therapy or <laughs> whatever. And you were still, and you was, uh, and you certainly were an uh, uh, old timer, can be called an old timer, if you sponsored a new baby instead of a pigeon. Or if you uh, call MCA, um, new, uh, still call it MCEA, Na this is Marty, of course, Marty's uh, uh, in National Council on Alcoholism, but she initially called it during the 40s National Council for Education on Alcoholism. So old timers know that. And, of course, if you read the second Saturday Evening Post article by uh, Jack Alexander in 1950, have any of you read that, called The Drunkard's Best Friend. It was a good article, but it didn't compare with the excitement that he found, one found in the, that early one in 1941. It wasn't all that, mm, well, it was, it was a good article. And it, uh, uh, um, <coughs> pardon me, Jack contributed so much to this fellowship. It was, it was really, even up to the time he died. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Also, uh, you're an old timer if you remember meeting or knowing Dr. Bob, uh, Bill, or Dr. Silkworth, or Ebby. Oof, I could spend a long time talking about Ebby. He, I enjoy Abby so much when I was receptionist. He was a, a um, 
loving person. He was an uh, intelligent, very well-educated person. He was good to talk to besides he knew a lot of wings upstate New York. And uh, we had a lot of fun talking about his relatives and mine. Um, and one day, this uh, is my one of the stories, um, Eddie partly sometimes came in sober. Sometimes he came in drunk. If he came in drunk, I didn't talk. He came over right, went through the lobby and threw himself onto the old couch. And that was it. One day, a um, gentleman came in like an English um, um, businessman with the derby hat and a nice black coat and uh, different colored pants, different gray pants or something, and an uh, umbrella. And uh, he came over to my desk. Yeah, he was passed out like a light. And um, he said, you know, I'm writing. I've written all I really know about AA and the founders. But he said, I'm still interested in knowing more about the guy who brought the message to Bill. <laughs> And I looked at him. I could not believe it. I still can't believe the story, but it's true. Um, and uh, I did a naughty thing. I pointed to Abby, but I quickly took him in to see one of the staff, the staff members. Um, but that, I'll never forget that. That was something. But Abby was a, well, oh, there's so many, many stories. Uh, he's all, we took him down. Finally, he had a, a lengthy sobriety, six years, I guess it was, down in Texas. Um, everybody in New York, it was their ambition when they came into AA or had been in AA for a while to um, uh, sponsor Abby. Um, to sober him up. And uh, everybody tried that. So finally, it was getting to see, you know, we're not having too much luck doing the whole thing. So one of our uh, members uh, got together, uh, um, well, a little money, and put Ebby on a plane, sent him down to Texas. And um, he very grumpily, you know, I, you know, I don't want to go. I don't want to do this sort of thing at all. However, he got, got a job. Eddie always said if he had a job and a girl, he could stay sober. Uh, <laughs> that was his criterion for staying sober. Uh, down there he did. He had a job, a short slip overnight for him, very slip, very, very short. And um, then he, um, the awfully good guy in one of the um, um, airline, airplane factories, I think it was, gave him a job. And he was there for about five, six years. And he was in charge of the girl uh, who uh, was in a very bad way. I think it was drugs as well as alcohol. And uh, she had a hard time staying sober. And Abby, uh, oh, he was such a, a wonderful uh, help to her. Well, she finally died. Abby came back and, of course, got drunk right away. Uh, but there are so many stories, so many wonderful things to share with Abby. I wish I could, you know, go on and on and on. However, you can't really do that. Back to the things that make an old-timer. If you remember that Al-Anon groups before 1951 were called auxiliary or associate groups, family-wise, they're just non-alcoholic groups. Um, if you remember the Broadway plays, and I'm sure you do, uh, at least they are, some of them are done over and, and, and re-exhibited frequently, is Harvey with Frank Fay, you know, the big rabbit. And uh, have you ever, have you, uh, all of you seen Harvey? Oh, you missed a lot. Uh, Cup of Trembling, probably you haven't. That was not too far, uh, uh, Elizabeth Bergner, a fine actress from Europe, played in that, an uh, alcoholic wife. Um... Come back, little Sheba. You probably know about that one. And in the movies, Breakdown, September Remember, with Susan Hayward. There's Susan Hayward. She was a, really a great actress. And, of course, The Lost Weekend that, uh, was, uh, was tremendous. After that movie, uh, I think there are at least five different uh, Hollywood movies, uh, 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 companies, came hammering on our door wanting to make a movie of AA. And uh, it was a, oh, it was a it was a big time because uh, they were coming in, the writers were coming in all the time. I thought there was one script done by Paramount. I thought it was awfully good, and it would be very helpful because it was written by Bob Smith. And um, but nobody thought that was too exciting. So, um, <laughs> but I thought it'd be fun to say this is fun, Robert Smith. Um, then Lost Weekend, something to live for, a voice in the mirror. Then there were a lot of books. 
wonderful books. This Believing World was one of my father's favorite books. Uh, a uh, exploration of their many faiths and whatnot. It said, he said, that Lewis Brown was the author, and he said, of movements, of many movements, their failure is part due to too much organization, politics, money, and power. And that is so true when you figure it, even some of the 1800 um, movements that were for alcoholism. <clears throat> never, never, never made it. Never made it. Especially the Washingtonians. You probably know a lot about those too. Uh, anyway, there was a glass crutch by Jim Bishop. I love that name, glass crutch, right? And if a man be, if a man be man, Harold uh, M. Now, Harold. Uh, every time I think of that, I think of an and before that too was a small office, very small. There were about 12 people, uh, including 13 maybe, including Bill. And um, this um, um, book dealt with a man who had DT. Now, we were all very excited about this book because it, and we knew it was a very helpful one to alcoholics. Uh, one day, um, a as we said, drunk often came in and sat down just like they did intergroups in those days too. Would come in, sit, you know, on the on the stool and on the chairs and whatnot. One day, this guy came in, sat for a long time, very silent, not making any trouble, and all of a sudden, bang! He got up and rolled. And uh, there's snakes under my chair. Snakes are there. And he was going around the room and having such a fun. The girls from the back room were headed for the elevator. Because they thought that really there were some snakes around, and they didn't want to be there. Bill or one of the guys was in the office, head in the staff's office, and they came out and grabbed, grabbed him all and said, "No, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. He's just having DTs," and brought them all back again. But there were I can't tell you how many. It, oh, it was just unbelievable how many things went on. Also, Dr. Jung's book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And Upper Room, the daily meditation uh, of the um, uh, uh, Methodist Church, was a very, very popular one, and I guess still is. It used to be up in, up in Michigan, and I think then it went back down in Tennessee to be published. Common Sense of Drinking, and we know Peabody. We call him Peabody uh, in, the, in the East, <laughs> not Peabody. <laughs> and, of course, Varieties of Religious Experience. And um, there is... Um, just so much to tell about Wa uh, um um can't think of his name. William William James James, James William James for heaven's sake. See what I mean? And uh he he contributed so much, but there's it would take us all afternoon if I went into that. I wrote um um article. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Then, of course, there was Dr. Jelinek, Dr. E.M. Jelinek's book, The Disease of Alcoholism. The funny little story about that is uh, he was a good friend of Bill. Bunky, we called, uh, Bill called him Bunky. And uh, Lois also described them as great pals and great buddies. Lois and I went on a trip uh, to see the uh, solar eclipse uh, one day and um, that was coming across Canada and coming down and um, all of a sudden, um, Lois, who was, had been on her way, wanted to be on her way coming back from the eclipse and go over to New Jersey, Dr. Jelinek had died, and they had done a statue and a, and a post uh, uh, um, uh, stat, uh, a pledge, or whatever you want to call it, of him, honor, to honor him. They wanted to give that to Bill. And, and, then, and after, in a post-mortem kind of thing, Lois... Um, was um, got get, going to get off at um, uh, um, can't think of the city up there in in Hall Halifax and go over to New Jersey, accept the statue, and then go back to New York. Well, she uh, couldn't do it, so they sent uh, because uh, there wasn't the proper um, um, background uh, 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 transportation to get her there and get her back. So we both went back to New York, and um, then they sent the statue to Lois. There was no name on it, nothing to indicate what it was or who it was for or what it was about. Lois had to send it out and put all the information on herself. 
But that was, uh, but uh, he did a wonderful job. Also, if you remember an old-timer, if you remember the most popular and accepted protection of anonymity at the public level in those very early days was a Halloween mask. You wore your head. And some of the newspapers had these at one occasion. They were writing about AA and had this great big, big picture of this guy with a big mask on his face. Also, a couple of them walking through the back alleys with wearing masks on their way to a meeting. And I remember uh, they were taking a picture of Bill at a meeting, and the photographer was standing back of Bill and taking a picture of the audience that pulled uh, um, face. At which time, uh, the guys, everybody in those days, wore uh, white handkerchiefs. And then they pulled out their handkerchiefs and put them over their face. And they had the face. And when you saw that picture, it was amazing, all these real odd-looking faces. But, no. but, that, but that was so funny. And uh, you certainly are an old-timer if you ever said or heard anyone say, uh, hey, Bill, who needs all those traditions, those damn traditions? And they just said that very often, believe me. Uh, and if you like, you still say the Alcoholic Foundation. If you're old time, you still say the Alcoholic Foundation works publishing uh, for AA, uh, for GSO and AAWS. And if you remember the kind of newspaper language used by reporters to describe AA events, such as the, say, the early 1942 annual New York dinner, these are some of the headlines. 400 ex-alcoholics toast new sanity. <laughs> 424 ex-slaves toast defeat a barley corn. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous describes how to break rum stranglehold. The newspapers also describe the New York penthouse dinner as a noisy affair and a lively, I crossed out the word gay because that's to be misinterpreted now. They said that gay party. Uh, <laughs> I know it. Much noise and laughter and plenitude after dinner speeches and yet not a hangover or a, even a mention of the headache to show for it. And I thought, gosh, a pet house certainly would be a good place if you wanted to raise the roof, right? Now, the serenity prayer, if you were an old timer, if you said the AA prayer instead of the serenity prayer. Now, I wrote a manuscript about 15 pages. And I called it Stalking the Wild Serenity Prayer. And I, <laughs> I did a lot of uh, background and research in it and got, oh, gosh, just a pile, a pile of possible sources where this came, could come from. Uh, if, I'm, if you don't mind, I think it's important because I, I don't know how many people are r really acquainted. Let me just read, not the whole manuscript, <laughs> but just the page and a half. And I can read it quickly. Uh, the actual origin of the serenity prayer has been, over the years, a tantalizing, elusive, and some still feel an unsolved mystery. Intrig I wrote this in 81, by the way. Intri intriguing to those of us at GSO who have, at one time or another, attempted to trace the prayer to authorities' um, unimpeachable source sources. The prayer entered unobtrusively into AA history in the year 1941. People get this date mixed up a lot. It was discovered in the in memoriam column of an early June edition of the New York Herald Tribune, and the exact wordings were, Mother, grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Goodbye. Some 15 years later, reminiscing about this event, Ruth Hockbacilius, our first non-alcoholic treasurer, uh, a, a secretary, of our staff said, it is the fact that Jack C. appeared at the office at 30 Beasley Street, Manhattan, one morning for a chat, and during the course of which he showed me the obituary source notice with the a serenity prayer. I was as much impressed with it as he was and asked him to leave it with me so that I could copy and use it for our letters to groups and loaners. At this uh, same time, Bobby B., who was also, this is an, our other staffer, who was also terrifically impressed with it, undoubtedly used it in her work with the many she contacted during the 24th Street Clubhouse, where she was in charge of that. Horace C., another um, a local uh, member on the Board of Trustees and helpful to Bill in the office and whatnot, had the idea of printing it on cards and paid for the first printing. All the local members, including Bill W., felt its relevance immediately. 
irrelevance immediately. As Bill said in Comments of Age, never had we seen so much AA in so few words. On June 12, 1941, Ruth wrote Henry S., a Washington, D.C. member and printer by profession, saying, one of the boys up here got a clipping from a local newspaper, which is uh, so very much to the point and so much to their liking that they have asked me to find out from you what it would cost to set it upon a small card, something like a visiting card, which can be carried in a wallet. Here it is. Would appreciate it if you would let me know right away. Henry answered back immediately and enthusiastically. He said, your cards are on the way, and my congratulations to the man who discovered that in the paper. I cannot recall any sentence that packed quite the wallop that that does, and during the day has shown it to the AAs that dropped in, and in each case have been asked for copies. I sent you 500 copies, <coughs> inasmuch as you didn't say how many you wanted. If you need any more, let me know. Incidentally, I am only a heel when I'm drunk, I hope. So naturally, there will be no charge for anything of this nature. <laughs> um, now, I'll take the very last uh, uh, notice about where it came from. The claim for authorship on behalf of Dr. Newmore, Niebuhr is formidable. No doubt about that at all. At the very least, he certainly authored one version, at least, at which the 1941 Obit Prayer could have been an adaptation, and yet. There is still another source to consider, which also needs some investigation. Back in the late 1950s, a staff member, Anita R., browsing in a downtown New York bookstore, came upon a small card, beautifully bordered with a scroll design, in which was centered a printed prayer, which said, a prayer, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, give us serenity to accept what cannot be changed, courage to change what should be changed, and wisdom to know the one from the other through Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At the bottom it says, from a 14th century prayer often called the General's Prayer. The card originated from a bookstore in England called Mowbray. At that time, 1957, we received at least two other references to this particular virgin. 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 Hmm. <laughs> Who that? <laughs> um, the writer quoted from earlier in this letter, citing uh, versions by St. Thomas Aquinas and Dr. Niebuhr had further information to offer. She said, I then found the prayer in another book, Between Dark and Dawn, by uh, uh, Frederick Hayes, and the prayer was marked 14th century in the words, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to the serenity except cannot be changed, courage to change what should be changed, and wisdom to know one from the other. I think that is, uh, uh, there's, that if, if there's one really truly unsolved mystery in AA, it is who wrote the prayer. It really is wonderful. Uh, now, do, do you, any of you know Calvin and Hobbes comic? It's a very, very cute one. Okay. Now, Calvin is about six years, seven years old. Little, uh, spicy, um, can be mean little kids. He has a, uh, a stuffed tiger that he carries around with him. Now, when he's, nobody's around, the tiger becomes human and, and uh, uh, up, stands on his feet and they talk and go uh, uh, having fun wherever they want to go. This particular one, Calvin says, know what I pray for? And the, uh, Hobbes says, what? <clears throat> Calvin says, the strength to change what I can the inability to accept what I can't, and the incapacity to know the difference. <laughs> the tiger says, you, you should lead an interesting life. Calvin says, oh, I already do. <laughs> it's so fascinating. I think that is, I, I couldn't resist that one. Now, onward and upward. You know, looking over those many years, what time is it? Uh, huh? Oh, I, 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 okay, now I'm going to rush. I'm not going to get long side light on time. <laughs> now, um, you know, we're looking again back at those early days. I think the exciting and the dramatic events happening in AA, uh, when I came along, had a lot to do, of course, with my staying there. I eventually forgot all about Mexico. still haven't gotten down there yet. So I did keep up activity in sculpture. 
for a while. Arthritis has come along. I think of what people uh, that decade of 45 to 55 as the most productive, unfolding, uh, developing era ever found in AA. And I think that is the most important one. Things happen. And you know, the mystery or the uh, um, excitement is that Bill did so many things, made so many um, um, uh things that, that were to be done, so many uh, things that needed to be done, uh, decisions to be taken, actions to take, and uh, here he was, full of uh, emphysema and um, uh, depression. And uh, it's amazing what he was able to do in that end. It was just uh, Now, by the end of 41, we could count about 170 groups, 100 of them well organized in membership nearly 6,000. The office was receiving about 125 inquiries a week. Uh, it was believed that two out of three active members were fully recovered, and every such case was employed. Uh, now, that period, that 40s period, I, won't, I was telling you about what we ladies were running around doing our own thing. That's true, but a lot of things were going on, and it would take a really, really big volume to, put, to tell everything about it. Um, for example, groups were formed for young people, for women, for black members, interracial groups, nuns, priests, doctors, and lawyers, and pilots, as my friend here knows, birds of a feather. Uh, meetings were held in boardrooms of banks, in church basements, in private living rooms, on main streets and skid rows, in the YMCAs, in hospitals, jails, and prisons, and aboard ships. And, of course, I think we all know that if you've taken many cruises, been on board a ship, uh, that there are so many. Have you uh, meeting tonight uh, for those who knew Bill W. Uh, passengers in the freighters and in the suburbs and in small rooms behind and above noisy local bars even. At home, the message was being carried abroad uh, and far distances by traveling salesman members. This was after the war and the vacation travelers by the shifting population of the late 40s post-war era. It was a really, really exciting thing that was going on. And I was part of that whole episode. Um, it was really typical um, of, of what that, that not, not the following, not the other period, but that particular period. Abroad, news of AA was carried by our AA servicemen, who had been, many of them AA members, had been uh, stationed in Japan and uh, 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 Germany, and they helped start AA over there a lot. Um, in uh, Japan, uh, they had 13 steps originally, and they had wise groups. You know what the wise groups were called? Chrysanthemums. And in uh, the early 1800s, the Washingtonians had the wise group. Wise were all the time, were around. And uh, part of the, of the program, so to speak, because they were, they were husbands and wives and families and part of it. And the uh, wives in the Washingtonians were called Martha Washington. And they lasted for a long time. And uh, there was just uh, a effort to get going in these various areas that was really, really just terribly exciting. Say, for example, the Merchant Marine Seaman. Um, um, Captain Jack S., who uh, went, took his, he was the head of one of the uh, ships, and uh, what do you call it, the executive of one of the ships. And he would go, when he got sober in, in AA, would take the ship along the coast of South Africa and across Japan and China and go to the local bars and leave the book and ask if there was any alcoholic he could talk to. And indeed, he, it was, uh, by 1949, we had international seamen's groups. And of course, we had uh, doctors' groups and all, and all those, as I mentioned before. Uh, U.S. Embassy. You know, it's very interesting that so many U.S. Embassies helped start groups. Uh, well, latest is um, uh, 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 Russia. Uh, my gosh, I remember 1945, uh, 55, uh, the lady who was the head of the health department there had called us on the telephone asking about, uh, giving her some information about AA. And uh, we sent a book and whatnot, but we never expected to hear from her, and indeed we did not. But as time changed, and, and the, the Russians changed, uh, now they're, they're uh, and there was the American embassy in Moscow, 
one of the members helped there too. And uh, I know my, my fr- one of my friends down in West Virginia knew her and traveled over there to see her. So, uh, well, in, in Norway and uh, <coughs> I can't, so many, so many different, uh, oh, down in Mexico. Gosh, they had a hard time uh, starting down in Mexico. Uh, Paulette down there was in the American Embassy doing all she could to get things started. Nothing was happening very fast until finally one of the guys in New York, a Catholic, realized what was Problem, probably the problem. Uh, so he got a, a boat together, a ship together, took some members down to Mexico City, talked to the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, and explained what AA was all about. And that changed the whole attitude. And it, AA then started to proliferate rapidly throughout. The, so it's, it's, you mean, the whole stories of how AA gets started all over is just amazing. Then we had our a uh, small office staff in New York really had its hands full to keep abreast and aware of all these service needs and these fast outreaching uh, situations on the several AA fronts all over the world. And it was incredible for us in the office to think of the long loners, AA loners and groups in such faraway places as Sumatra, Japan, Nepal. Nepal asked for us to come over and to help. Uh, I mean, can you believe it? Way up on top of the world, they wrote us and asked us to come, send somebody over to help them get sober. And um, the Antarctic North and South Pole and all around the middle. And it was just uh, a um, um, uh, wave of all this recovery going on in so many countries, and it still exists today. It really is. There are a lot of not-so-helpful things going on also. It was supposed to be a, a unity, but a lot of it was disunity. For example, it was a decade of specific fears and potential dangers abounded, any of which could threaten the unity of the society from within. Since 1939, first how to get money and later how to handle it caused concern. For example, what is needed, what, how much money would be needed, if any. Nobody thought we needed very much money at all. We didn't, you know, not get excited about that. Then there was anxiety that the groups, as they started to grow, might not support the service services at headquarters foundation. The third fear concerning money was that bequests left to AA by non-AA friends, grateful relatives and admiring friends, might overwhelm the fellowship and so firmed up the resolution of self-support action by the Board of Trustees in 1949. Another fear was seen in any dilution of AA's primary purpose, for example, taking in as members and victims other than alcoholics. Who could be a member was often, often discussed, not only the grapevine, Bill wrote about it, problems other than alcohol, uh, and uh, that was, uh, uh, Bill wrote about it in practically every book he had. In the late um, 40s, and in inadvertently otherwise, marrying AA to other agencies, I remember all of that so well, working in the alcoholic field, alcoholism field, particularly distressing and alarming episode was a, uh, uh, well, it's too long, to go into all of that with Marty making a little boo-boo with the MCA in 1946, uh, saying that if they gave some money to help support MCA, Alcoholics Anonymous would benefit from it. Well, the next four years, it was a total chaos. Uh, and chaos in our office, because the office <laughs> considered us responsible, you know, for any of these things that were happening. Um, there was dangers also. In, the, in neglecting the importance of sponsorship, the power-driving egos, refusing to accept and relate the meaning of the anonymity tradition, the personal ambition, individuals handed out endorsements and professionalizing their membership. There was dangers inherent in the management of clubs, of gambling and boy-girl shenanigans in the clubhouses. Should AA meetings be held regularly in the clubhouses was often discussed until it really got, and Bill wrote about that in the grapevine, early grapevine of two tough membership rules and regulations in some groups of local founders, knitting and local newspaper editors, all, they all considered themselves the, the founders, the leaders, and that Bill didn't have that much, you know, to do with it at all anymore. And editors acting as true. So in some cases, in the problems with lies, interfering with group affairs, that was all over the place. I remember we got a letter from a group down south saying, please write their wives and tell them they got to turn around and do things right. What happened, the problem was that they were in a clubhouse, two rooms plus a kitchen. 
Kitchen was one end, the AAs met in the middle, the Ys met on the outside. Now, the Ys, as you probably know, always get stop early and uh, get the uh, snacks or the luncheons ready. So they went through the uh, uh, AA's club uh, uh, room uh, to prepare for it. This did not appear well to the uh, uh, AA's, and so they asked us to do something about it. And I thought, you know, heck, why just didn't they change rooms? Why didn't, why didn't the wife meet in the middle or the AA's on the outside? And then they wouldn't there'd be any problem. Well, anyway, those were one of the things we had. As Bill put it, in the long form of Tradition 7, nothing can so surely destroy our spiritual heritage as steel disputes over property, money, and authority. How right he was when one thinks about it, and it's really a mystery and a miracle that AA as a society has faced and overcome all these collective fears and dangers and continue vigilant and, and on guard against their reoccurrence. It certainly is true. I've told you, and you know about Bill and Lois, of what they did during the 40s and that thing. The growth did continue with that desperate and kind of fractured uh, unity that happened in the 40s. By, since the office was not overseen properly either, really, and Bill and Lois were away traveling all the time. It, uh, a lot of things happened that wouldn't, would not have needed to have happened. One of the things was that the trustees, really didn't want to interfere. They wanted Bill not to interfere with the groups. When I first met Bill in the office, that's what he was going on and on about, and uh, that they weren't letting him do what he wanted to do or giving any support to it. And also that there was a this um, the, pr the problems of, of uh, how you're going to put it all together to make it work. And so finally they got a general service committee at the office started that took command, took, and, and then it started, then things started to grow from then on. And then we got into the service decades, and we're still in them, and they're still spreading, and it's just a miracle the whole thing happened. It's interesting that the membership today is, when I first came, it was about uh, 40,000 members and 1,200 groups. Now it is about 175 countries all over the world. Um, a probably about 100,000 groups, and probably 2.5 million, probably by now 3 million members. Uh -oh. And it is still spreading. It's, it's a miracle. Well, what I, what I think is interesting about it, just to give a last, I have a closing with what Bill had to say, too. He said, I'll quote Bill, uh, I said, I'll quote Bill just one last time, this time from the 1947 tradition pamphlet. He said, in the years that lie ahead, Alcoholics Anonymous faces a supreme test, the great ordeal of its own prosperity and success. I think it will prove the greatest trial of all. If we can weather that, our destiny will be secure. And I think that's a very smart thing. Thank you very much for listening. It's um, so much to say. And uh, so one day I'm going to put it all together, put it in a pamphlet or something, and... Uh, Anybody can use it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.